Okay, so moving forward, yes. even in the previous classes and even in the test, we've been using the Uniprof database by itself without even downloading information. Last test, we have to save the trees, but it was not a function or a specific function of the database. However, there's a, another one that it's actually a specific function, which is the access to the sequences. That specific information can be downloaded per a specific sequence. For whatever reason you have, you can just click there on FASTA, and what you will get is something that looks like this, for example, in the case of insulin. And here on the sequence, clicking on the FASTA icon is going to give you that. You have already become acquainted with that. Contains the information about the species, the protein, uh, the evidence of the protein itself, as well as the version of the sequence, right? So that is pretty useful. Uh, I usually don't recommend getting the information of that sequence in itself unless you are planning on using it for something very specific, other w or if you are going to be away from an internet connection, because otherwise doesn't have a lot of value, okay? Not on its own. However, we need to cover a couple of things that are related to that sequence, and those are a very, a, a couple of things that are maybe obvious, maybe not. And I want to bring these definitions about just because uh, they are going to be relevant slightly later today. First, the somatic mutation. This encompasses any mutation that happens in a cell that will be passed on to the cellular descendants. That means, not quite as it sounds, that it's going to be inherited. Only that cellular cells that come from that cell that got the mutation are going to get the mutation. And this could be the case of, for example, any mutation happening in the bone marrow, it's going to be passed on to the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and others, but, but they are not going to be inherited. That other category, the germline mutation, that is a mutation happening in the sperm on the ovum, and that will actually be passed on to a different generation. Why the importance of these two mutations? Because if we start talking about mutations in proteins without knowing what cell type they are occurring on, we cannot distinguish this. In proteins, everything is a mutation, and that's it. We don't know if they are going to be inherited or not. And we need just to keep these ideas in mind. For example, if we go about not only hemoglobin, but uh, proteins like this one, like insulin, if we look at, where is my mouse here? If we look at the sequences, we can start picking up information very specific to this protein. This sequence, it turns out that it's labeled as two plus, and it's because in this entry, we have two isoforms that are produced by alternative splicing. So that is, there is only one gene, but because these are eukaryotic genes, they have introns and exons, and it turns out that for this protein at least, two different versions can be formed by a biological process. This is not, that, that is, two proteins can be detected, and that is not the product of a mutation. It's actually it's something normal. However, uh, there is this other information that there are two other potential isoforms that have been computationally mapped. In a way, this subsection of sequences, it's kind of having a section that says it's reviewed because of this alternative splicing form, and another one that it's unreviewed, that it looks, but to a computer, it looks like there's another two examples of these proteins, but it's not based on an experiment or not directly assigned to an experiment of somebody looking for isoforms of those proteins. I have another protein up here, uh, the glucokinase, that has even more information. This entry describes three isoforms 
produced by alternative splicing. So one gene is producing two different proteins, and depending on the circumstances, well, not evolution, development or others, so one of those is going to be expressed. Um, some isoforms are produced by alternative promoter usage, and this apparently enabled this exokinase to be regulated by insulin in the liver and glucose in the beta cell. So the same gene in two different cell types, it's going to be differentially regulated by two different molecules. Sometimes there is this information. This comes not because the database, a computer, guessed this information, but because somebody went in and did some experiments that suggest that. And Beyond that, there's three other potential isoforms mapped. Eukaryotic genomes are going to be like that. Eukaryotic gene expression is going to be like that. Genes, one single gene can produce many proteins, and sometimes we are not even sure how many proteins. You are going to run, well, if you go into this uh, rabbit hole, sometimes you're going to find that a single gene can have as many as 10, 20 different proteins that have been detected under one condition or another. And it's uncertain if they are just pieces, fragments of the protein that got broken, or there's actually a, a biological process behind it. I like Uniprot because it tells you straight up, there's evidence for this, and, but not for this one. Take it with a pinch of salt. Okay, so, but I, I thought I had a, another up with hemoglobin, I'm going to go back to the usual example, but just because there's something there that we need to remember and keep in mind, really. The reason for having this hemoglobin as an example always is because, well, it's a very well studied protein, but it also has another particularity that should be fairly obvious, I mean to you, not from the database. Here in the function, actually this was a, not a good example, let me find beta. Here in the function it should, it should say these kind of things. Part of the function involves sites for metal binding. The heme group, the heme group is not part of the sequence. The heme group is part of the function, but not part of the sequence. Sometimes we are going to run into that kind of pitfalls, proteins that require a heme group, a chlorophyll group, um, FM, uh, what is it, a flavin mononucleotide, they might be indicated in the function, but they are never going to be coded in the sequence. For a hemoglobin, that actually is kind of tough, because if you are looking for proteins, let's say not in hominids, as in the test, but in bacteria that could be precursors to hemoglobin, you cannot really tell if they are precursors if they do not bind heme groups, right? So that makes certain things difficult, but for better or worse, others are going to be a little bit simpler. So here we have hemoglobin, insulin, and uh, glucokinase in my tabs. What I'm going to show you now is something that slightly or in a tangential manner tries to address this type of information that is not part of the genomic sequence. And I'm talking about post-translational modifications. Every single one of you that has taken a cell biology class knows that proteins that are going to be secreted into the exterior of the cell have to be modified. Disulfurs, glycosylations, phosphorylations are the norm. And here is where we can find part of that. Here in which are we looking at? Hemoglobin, this hemoglobin beta. First we have this kind of a weird piece of information. It says that it is an initiator, an initiator methionine. Have you taken molecular biology already? Mm -hmm. Every single protein that comes from a being evolved in this planet starts with a methionine. But in eukaryotes, that methionine is usually removed. So if you sequence the protein, it's missing. But it's coded in the sequence. And this is the first molecule processing indicator here. Then it tells us nicely that from number 2 to 147 residues, that is the mature protein. That is what we are supposed to find. This type of uh, information is likely to be found only in proteins with high level of annotation. If nobody knows if they are modified like this or what is the mature protein, you are not going to find it. 
Why is it useful? Well, hemoglobin beta is a single polypeptide, right? No surprises there. What about insulin? How does insulin supposed to look? <laughs> so what do you read there? <sighs> well, first it has a signal peptide which, if you remember your cell biology, means it has to go somewhere, either into a compartment within the cell or to the outside. We know that it has to go to the bloodstream. But, only, but not only that, there's, it turns out that the peptide, that, or the protein that is originally produced, has to be broken into three pieces. And no single one is the insulin as a mature thing. It's actually A and B together with a disulfide, uh, not one, several disulfide bonds, according to these three, that actually make the insulin. So this type of modifications is not encoded into the genome. The protein gets synthesized, gets translated, and then a protease breaks it into these three pieces that together are insulin. Without looking at this, you could be fooled into thinking that insulin is a single thing, when it's in fact two polypeptides covalently bonded even if they were part of the single gene. You see how it's trying to address the complexities of what happens after the genome? Okay, cool. The disulfide bond here is noted, the positions of the, uh, the peptide, the protein where the disulfides are formed. Unfortunately, uh, there's evidence, plenty of evidence, so there's no guesses here. It's easy to read. And that's about it. We have, at least within the database, we don't have any more information. Okay, might be true, make, make sense. If we check the subcellular location, yeah, it's supposed to be secreted, so no, no problems here. What about hemoglobin? Hemoglobin actually has a long list of modifications. Residue number two, the first one in the mature protein, can be acetylated or can be succinylated, and this comes by similarity. If you remember cell biology again, there's a specific sequences in proteins that are usually recognized for these chemical modifications. So these ones are not something that has been detected, but it could happen. There's phosphorylation of this serine, of this one, of this one, and those are likely to be documented experimentally and by similarity. Mm -hmm. This one is a similarity, similarity, and similarity. So these are the ones that are likely to actually happen in a, an organism, a human. If I click there, we can see there's papers, right? And we could always go in there and check when did this happen? Was it for a patient of a disease? Was it for normal people? Was it like an ethnicity thing? We can always extract that information. Yes. So my similarity means that it is like something we already know? Oh, okay. According, it's going to be different for different proteins. In the case of these annotations for hemoglobin, it turns out that I don't identify that organism, but in that organism, that has been detected. And, in, and this one has been detected in mouse. Oh, okay. But like, for example, in the test, we saw that mm, the hemoglobin of the mouse, the heme group was, was far away from the one of the human. You mean, evolutionarily speaking, yeah. we are not that similar, uh -huh. right? Yes. But we didn't quantify it. Like, what would be a similarity that would allow a cellular system to identify a piece of this protein to modify the covalent? Uh, just like, just in that rest year. Okay. It could be, if we follow the rules of cellular biology, the signatures are usually a few amino acids, right? So we don't know what the rules are for that. Mm -hmm. You raise a very important point or a very relevant. What if the mechanism that exists in the mouse for that modification does not exist in the human? We don't know, right? That's why it's annotated like that. This is not a certainty. It's something that could happen. Hemoglobin, uh, insulin, let's take a look at glucokinase. Why did I pick insulin and hemoglobin? Those are proteins that are gonna be secreted. They are gonna be either in the cytosol, and sometimes in the extracellular milieu, 
But glucokinase, in general, should be only intracellularly, right? Is there any PTM for this one? Well, for better or worse, it te this tells us that, in fact, the methionine seemingly is not processed for this particular protein, and there's no other information. There's links to other databases, and that's about it, okay? Pretty much this covers the variations you are going to find for different proteins. Sometimes you're going to find tons of information, sometimes you're not going to find much, and it's better to go to these more specialized databases. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take again this example, hexokinase, and I'm going to click on a very specific one. Here, if you don't know what these databases are, you can always just put the mouse on top of it and click and he ha here we have the, J the Japan Proteome Standard Repository Database which I don't know what it is the Massive Spectrometry Interactive Virtual Environment this one is cool because the only way to detect ti those tiny changes like uh, acetylation which is going to be three atoms more to a protein is with mass spectrometry a database of protein abundance averages across all three domains of life. Okay, cool. Peptide Atlas, mm, I don't get it. Proteomics Identification Database. So some of them seem to be more general and other very specialized. And not, eh, this one is clearly another proteomics database, multi-organism protein resource. Integrated resource for post-translational modifications in systems biology context and a comprehensive resource for the study of protein post-translational modifications in human, mouse and rat. You can get information for all of this. If it's not listed, in generally it means there's no information. But this one is listed, the information is not placed here. But if we click over there, we are going to be uh, magically taken there. Oh, sorry, I click on the ground place. To this one. This, I'm showing you this one because this one is one that I like a lot. The reason I like it is because it's fairly easy to read. Okay, first, we have a graph. That's easy to read, right? On the x-axis, we have number of a residue. And on the y, we have a total number of references, which is kind of a weird metric. But the purpose of this database, as many others, is to actually give you information that is relevant, that is scientifically public in a way, and that's why it uses publication. We have a couple of items that are not so clear, like HTTP or LTP, but you can always click on them. High throughput papers, the number of records in which this modification was assigned using only proteomic discovery mass spectrometry. Pretty much it means if somebody grabbed a ton of patients and got the proteome, that information is there. But it counts only as the detection of one instance of that modification, not as, as the number of patients. And the low throughput is going to be kind of the opposite. The number of records in which this modification site was determined using methods other than discovery mass spectrometry. That means that it was a directed experiment. Somebody maybe collected, in this case, uh, liver cells and ran an ELISA and it was detected in different person. Okay? This approach, they balance it so that you can choose what impact the different processes have. If you want to go for the, let's call it artisanal results, the LTP. And the ones that are bulk, the HTP. Mm -hmm. And you can see the variations. Not everybody was looking for the same thing, so they did not detect the same thing. Next, we have the colors. In blue, phosphorylation. Green, acetylation. Orange, ubiquitinylation. And there's a gray for others. I don't know if you can actually tell the difference between the colors, but there's tons of sites for ubiquitinylation. And a couple, and actually all of them concentrated here for the phosphorylation. If we had only that graph in a non-interactive fashion, that would be kind of awful. But lucky us, we can navigate the graph, zoom in. Oh, that one was kind of hidden. There were more than one in that part. 
and zoom in even to the amino acid level yeah. to figure out which modifications are in what amino acid. And not only that, we can also have these somatic and germline modifications. According to this, yes, so if I'm reading this correctly, there's no somatic cancer mutations associated with this protein, and that's why we don't get any scale. But on the blue one, we do get a scale, and we have a, an allele frequency. So that means, let's see if it actually changes. Yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure it's actually working, so maybe there's no information for that either. But in the cases where there is, you can take advantage of those and correlate them with other uh, processes than just the normal glycokinase like function. We also have this filter, if you are very stringent and you don't want to take into account information with less than five papers, you click on that. Okay? No more input. Right. I mean, not everybody is doing hexokinase, so those things have been detected less than five times. It also has this information, which is less visual, but it's pretty much what we have already seen on the Uniprot. The size of the protein, the, G, the gene symbol, the other names of the proteins. In this ca case, it's emphasizing the disease or the diseases related to that. It leads back to the Uniprot. And these tabs over there, I like a lot because if you are interested in cancer, you can just click on there and it's going to tell you tons of important relevant information. For example, the percentage of mutations for this protein in those specific diseases. Now, let me just emphasize something I already said. If you look at all of these cell types, none, well, except this one, none is going to lead to a germline mutation, right? All of the mutations from here to the top are somatic. So if you, as a clinical biochemist, were, were trying to use this as a diagnosis, it would be apparently cool because it shouldn't show or it's not going to show for any germline mutation, only for somatics, specifically or almost specifically for this type of cancer. Now, th that doesn't mean that it's the cause, just that there's a correlation. Richard, do you know why, why that is called a lollipop flood? Oh, you. Oh, that one is a lollipop. Because oh, yeah, okay. they look like lollipops. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Which country is like more advanced in bioinformatics? Like Uniprint is well, from I don't know. the states. No, it's, it's actually European, originally it's European. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it from Johns Hopkins? It, no, that's uh, Homim. Ah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Uniprint started as part of the EMBOL, the European something, mm -hmm. something. <laughs> It's hidden in the mists of time for me. The European Molecular Biology Laboratory. Mm. I'd say, uh, I'd say Europe is pretty, pretty advanced. Also Japan, right? Because mm. there was uh, I, I, don't, I haven't seen them doing as much interesting things. Okay. I mean, right now, probably if we go and do the obvious silly thing, going on PubMed and look up for papers, I'll say Europe. Okay. But that's me. And you know, in fact, if we were to use a more important metric for you, where are they hiring? Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah. there, they, there's, every year there's at least two positions in doing bioinformatics things. Like, I, I don't even, did we even see that here? Sometimes they even announce them here on the Uniprot. Let's check. Time's 
may or follow them on Twitter because they really put that there. Yeah, I don't see those here. Hey, pre-release of the coronavirus. Protein spotlight, getting started. Now, yeah, follow them on Twitter because I'm pretty sure I've seen more than once that they are offering positions. But anyway, <laughs> that's kind of tangential to the class. Where was my here? Here. Okay, I have these two. Aha. Notice that you can also, because this was a database for mouse, rat, and human, you can change to different genes, one or the other. Why is this important? Well, even if we are very lucky, we are very unlikely to be able to have humans in our lab to experiment on, <laughs> right? I like this, pro this uh, database because it allows you to check if that information is available for the mouse or the rat as models. If you were interested in understanding the function of glucokinase when it's phosphorylated or ubiquitinylated, you have as an alternative for the human, the mouse model. Let's take also a look at insulin. Uh, PTM, here we go, and the same database. I'm choosing phosphoside because it's the one I have used the most and I like it. You can always explore the other ones. This one, for example, has information for the glycosylation of the protein, which is interesting too. Okay, insulin, pretty clear, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Well, just one, but well, yeah. it's one, just one publication, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. The mouse over allows you to see the class of the modification, the references, where is it located in the sequence, and if it's one uh, type of mutation, the somatic or the germline. Here, there, here there's even a picture because it has been crystallized and solved. Of course, we can check what happens for the insulin on, well, I think, yeah, mouse, same, and rat. Okay, pretty similar. You could study diseases like uh, diabetes in that model. So that was, yeah, we haven't tried hemoglobin, right? Here, here on this one, we have these predictions, or rather, this indication for phosphorylation based on papers. Let's see what the database says about that. Okay, so it's be even better annotated. Now we have, can you see, read the highest number over there? So this one, this specific phosphorylation has 546 references. So that for sure is something that happens on that protein. Mm -hmm. And again, the interesting part of this metric is not that there is a certainty or a number of phosphorylations, it's that it has been reported, it has been confirmed. The, here in this graph, we can actually use this log two transformation, which just make this easy to read. Now, because of that transformation, even those that have one reference can be compared quickly, right? So even if we filter the minimum five references, we'd still get a lot. And for the scale, this scale is actually iffy. But if we wanted to understand what's going on with these phosphorylations, now we have a map to lead us on that regard. And of course, all of this information is not related to any mutation in cancer, mm -hmm. right? This make me that nobody has looked into it or that it, they have looked into it and there's no correlation. The emptiness, don't let the emptiness fool you as to imply that they have nothing to do with it. Just that there's no information. Okay, before moving on, before moving on partially, would you like to explore something else from this information? Mm. 
pero entonces, ¿cómo se llegaba ahí? O sea, se usaba... ¿De ahí cómo se llega a la, a la, al plot? To that specific one, mm -hmm. so you pick your protein, mm -hmm. right? You can do several things. For in this case, being a rat, I can just go to the post processing, or sorry, highlight it and see what's going on. Okay. okay? That's the easiest. Now, regardless of how much information is listed here, here are the databases. Yeah. And you didn't share. <laughs> Everybody's hungry. Everybody <laughs> wants to go. No, I'm just kidding. Here you can go to the site, to specifically that database. Okay. I usually prefer to go open link in new tab, but you can easily go back and forth. In the case of, there, the, there is this carbonylation sites, which are relevant and in general specific for proteins that are in the bloodstream. In the case of hemoglobin, transport of CO2 happens through several mechanisms, and this is one of those. So don't expect always to see the same databases available for everything. Let's look into coronavirus. There, <laughs> there was the news. Yeah, there's plenty of news, but it's not something that is very well organized, as far as I can see. They also tweeted it. Yeah. Huh? Oh. I retweeted yeah. it. Okay. Yeah, but look at that. That is pretty preliminary. There's the sequence which is not even open. Ah, I'm going to open it on Chimera. Sorry. Uh, I thought there was going to be a page like the other ones. No, come on, it's too soon. What are my fans going to think? I retweeted it. <laughs> Let's see what the information is. And more importantly, this read me. This is so old fashioned that I guess I always ignore it. This readme should say the very basics of whatever is there on that site, but it's crafted in such a way that it's not even displaying a web page. And the reason is because these things are still based on a Unix type file system, so they are expecting you to actually read them on a terminal. I'm not going to do that, that's too old fashioned for you guys. <laughs> But I'm going to show you the contents, just to satisfy your curiosity. Does this look familiar? Uh, DNA sequence, right? And it has, as we've seen for influenza, not a, spe not a specific strain, but some information that lets you set the location of where this virus was identified. Protein evidence. Very iffy for this one, kind of iffy, but for this one, for sure. This is the, de so we have the two file formats, a FASTA, which contains only a sequence, and the DAT, that contains more information about what is this. For example, the classical names for s proteins in viruses, either structural or non-structural proteins, the proteases, oh, a translation inhibitor, I didn't know about that. Uh, the polymerase, for replicating itself. Mm, and what is this, guys? Show me that you have some molecular biology literacy. Not only a polymerase, it's an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. What does that tell you about the virus? Nothing? It's an RNA virus that replicates as an RNA virus. So you need to take the RNA and produce more RNA. And it's also going to do that to produce the transcripts, right? The RNA to RNA that is messenger or the RNA to the RNA that is the genomic RNA. This one is because, why is this because? What do you need that? What do the virus needs that? What do you know about eukaryotic molecular biology? Uh, like a, a 
epigenetics. You so need to prime the mRNA, mRNA so that the ribosome recognizes it. So the virus has its own enzyme to do that to fool our cells. And this is part of that mechanism for sure. So anyway, I'm not a virologist. <laughs> I'm just interested in some viruses. Uh, this file provides pre-release, that's why it doesn't have a page yet, access to the uh, 2019 NCOV Wuhan coronavirus protein sequence in Uniprot from the current public health emergency. The data will become part of the future Uniprot release and may be subject to future changes. Okay, so this is like the preview, right? Mm -hmm. It's the trailer of the movie. Maybe it's not gonna be like this, but hey, there you go. Anybody else? <laughs> you know, now that we brought an example like that, let me see if we can take a look at not influenza uh, on itself, thing? but to the glycosylation or the post relation modification. Yeah, look at this. But which strain are we looking at? I don't understand. It should have information for the one that I selected, which was the NSA one. Ah, sorry. Um, ah, oh, this one is just giving me information for the protein. Yeah, let me select this one, H1N1. Here we go. Look at the list of glycosylate, well, the modifications. Plenty of glycosylations, disulfide bonds, disulfide bonds, glycosylation. Some of these are annotations. So we already seen by similitude or similarity, by papers, and in this case, it's according to certain rules. That is, if you remember cell biology, it has the pattern that if it passes through the Golgi and the ER, it's gonna get glycosylated like that. Most of, the, of these modifications are like that. They are expected to happen, but there's no verification. And the reason is because virus are fleeting. <laughs> There's one infection, it gets characterized one, and if once and if nobody cares, that's it. Nobody's gonna submit more information. That's why we sometimes have something like this. This particular version of the virus might be an established uh, strain in the lab. So it's not caught in the wild, it's not a specific strain, it's something that has been already used in the lab and continuously used like that. Even though it would have a strain, but it's nothing like this one that was caught in the wild. And you're talking like about SARS, that it stopped being relevant, so people stopped studying it? The peop so the people stops detecting strains. Ah, okay. But there might be like a general SARS virus that's still used in some labs and it becomes like the standard reference organism. Mm. Because there's no reference for the viruses, right? Or at least none that it's functional for the pandemics. No. In the pandemics, what do we need to know? Where, when, how? And that's the information that gets preserved. But it's in the, if it's in the lab, in a petri dish, they are not going to name it after the lab, the day it was cultured. You know? it gets lo that information gets lost in a way. But then again, this website is for proteins, not for a specific virus. Mm -hmm. And there's other databases that are for virus. Okay. Any other questions? Doubts, curiosities? No? Nothing? Now it's the turn of OMI, the online Mendelian inheritance in man which, as the name implies, it's kind of limited because it's for men, well, human, <laughs> not men only, there's females, of course, mm -hmm. and Mendelian inheritance. So this is going to be a specific for proteins that have a phenotype that can be inherited in that part. That's also one of the reasons of keeping hemoglobin close by. Because hemoglobin has being studied a lot because it has several diseases associated 
and several genes that are known. In fact, if I only type hemoglobin, I get these many entries. Now, thinking again that this is human, why would I get so many results? 200. We know that there's how many genes? Like nine? So how come I get this? Well, the main difference in this database, we can find it in the frequently asked questions. It's because, oh, sorry, I did use the wrong one. It's because the OMIN has a very specific goal in mind. And it's pretty much here. There's going to be entries also defined by a number, different from the ones in Uniprot, and they are going to have different symbology. If they have an asterisk, it means that it indicates a gene. So if I go back to my search, this one indicates a gene. And in fact, it's referred in the old-fashioned naming scheme as a locus. This one is another gene. This one is another gene. This one is another gene. But this clearly is not a gene. Not only because of the name, but also because it has a different indication. If we look over here, it turns out that that symbol indicates that this is a descriptive entry, usually of a phenotype. Why is this important? Because there's going to be phenotypes that can have different genes involved, not only one. There is a plus sign that indicates that the entry contains the description of a gene of known sequence and phenotype or a uh, percent sign where the entry confirms a Mendelian phenotype or phenotypic locus, but the molecular basis is not known. That is, they know that there is a phenotype associated, but the cause is completely unknown. No symbol, pretty much everything is unclear, and a caret is that the entry has been removed. So this is totally different, right? It's focusing entirely on the phenotypes, which is kind of useful when you are looking for this. Instead of giving us the first result as a protein or as a locus or as a gene, it tells us that there's a very specific phenotype, a delta beta thalassemia, that is related to that gene. Uh, we have a couple of minutes, so I'm going to click on the protein first, and then next class we're going to talk, talk about the phenotypes, because they are going to be differently organized. Whereas the protein, it's going to look a lot, uh, it's going to look like the uniprot, it's organized very differently. Just straight up, we see that all of the sternal links are over here, all of the internal information is over here, and right off the bat, we get different codes and a table. These codes, in general, I'm, it's not expected for you to know because they are very specific. Cytogenetic location. Have you ever seen that type of codes? Yes. Okay, just a few. So it means this is on the 11th chromosome in one of the arms, in the specifically, and in this cytogenetic location, which is probably related to the old patterns of bands that you can stain. The gene symbol, that's going to be the same as uh, Uniprot, and the genomic coordinates, which are more, uh, at least easier for me to read, it says exactly the same over here, but with the coordinates of the chromosome and the specific number of nucleotides where that gene is coded. So here we have that on the 11th chromosome, on the nucleotide 5,225,463 to the 5,227,070. You can tell that these are hyperlinks, so if you click on those, we are probably going to be taken to another database with where we, if we are lucky, we're going to find all of the information pertaining to that. This database I hate a lot because it's ridiculously difficult to read anything from here, right? I, I cannot even tell if I'm really on the gene or not, what part of the gene, which direction. So let's ignore it for the time being and let's go back to something simple. And then right off the bat we have this gene genotype rela phenotype relationships. Still the same location and now what we have is a list of the phenotypes that are associated with this protein or th this gene. 
there is malaria resistance, the thalassemia, erythrocytosis, Haynes body anemia, all of these, we could call them disease for the time being, but they are phenotypes with different phenotypes associated and how the inheritance is displayed. Autosomic dominant, autosomic recessive, and a phenotype mapping key. So straight off the bat, we, we are not treated to the molecular properties. This is the phenotypical ones. How are these phenotypes brought about? We have no idea, but we know that they have a name. They can probably be identified, and we know something about the inheritance. The inheritance, I even told this is Mendelian, it's not going to be restricted to autosomic. I think, um, no, we don't have the map here. We can find autosomic dominant, recessive, uh, X or Y linked for those that are associated with the gender and mitochondria. So I think th I, that covers all of the variations for that. Of course, there's either empty or unknown. And the mapping, the molecular basis of the order is known. So here, we don't have the same parameters of reviewed protein evidence or annotated, here are pretty much the, here in this information. Either we know the gene and we know the phenotypes and the molecular basis for those, or some of this information is going to be missing. And we only know the phenotype, but not the molecular cause and variations thereof. So this has a totally different focus. We can change the way this information is displayed and for example here, instead of looking specifically at a condensed version, now we can look at, at the clinical variations of this. If cycle cell anemia, it's going to behave like this autosomal recessive uh, disease, it's going to have cardiovascular effect described here as diagnosis in the lung, acute chest syndrome. Well, you can see that cycle cell anemia is very well studied and all of the ways it could be diagnosed are pasted here. This Heinz body anemia, it's very specific in that it's going to affect only the blood or mostly the blood and how you can find this, how could you detect this in a, in a laboratory. Just with the click on that option, we get a totally different view. So you can study these diseases from the purely molecular point of view or if you want to diagnose them, you can look at them for the purely, from the purely clinical point of view. It's not the only information, we can also get sometimes all of these variations. Sometimes this, that could be very interesting, and I hinted when we were looking at the phosphorylation side. What if you want to study this in an animal model? Is there an animal model, model already or not? In this case, yeah, we have several apparently. And each one of these uh, paragraphs are usually based on a citation. So this, in a way, is a very curated database because it's not a guess mm -hmm. or a comparison, but somebody already tried doing this. And if you read the first line, they created a mouse model without, uh, well, so for this disease by deleting both beta-like globin genes in the mouse embryonic stem cells. Like, that is a very high-level work, right? It's not only getting their mice, but they already make these mutations in the embryonic stem cells. And you can read the results if it's working or not. And then again, there's plenty of other things. Uh, over here, this other uh, view I like because it's also very molecular. Here we have all the variations that don't necessarily need to produce a phenotype. These are the variations in the populations for this protein. What name they have, usually associated with the location where they were identified. And what is the mutation? So glycine for arginine, the single nucleotide polymorphism, and the clinical variations. So you see this database is totally different from Uniprot, but not because of the information it contains, but the way it's focusing on the display and the application. Of course, it's far more limited because it's only humans. <laughs> no animals here. We don't know if this is true for mice. We don't know if it is true or was true or other hominids, let's say, uh, what is popular nowadays? Homo erectus, or what is the name of the other one that we are supposed to have made with? Um, Neanderthal. We don't know if that is true for that, but for humans, this is what we know. So 
so the emphasis changes a lot. Okay, so next class we're gonna continue delving into homing. I'm gonna stick to hemoglobin. As you can see, it's always the one that has been studied the most, so we can make the best examples out. If you have any questions, this is the time. No? Well, next class, there would be more time for more questions. Have a good afternoon.